before we start, let's just, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for joining Stanley and for what you're doing through them. Father, we thank you for your word. And I just ask that as, as we, we study a little bit about this feast of the Lord, that you would really plant something in our heart. Lord, we are asking for just like you did on that Shavuot right after you had ascended and you sent the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, even afresh in our lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 All right, Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, I have a couple of the main points right there, but I'm going to go ahead and open up to the passage. Verses 15 through 21. And it says this, Then you are to count from the morrow after the Shabbat, from the day that you brought the Omer of the wave offering, seven complete Shabbatot. That's seven sevens. Until the morrow after the seventh Shabbat, you are to count 50 days, and then present a new grain offering to Adonai. You are to bring out of your houses two loaves of bread for a wave offering, made with two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour. They are to be baked with chametz as first fruits to Adonai. You are to present along with the bread seven one-year-old lambs without blemish, one young bull, and two rams. They will become burnt offerings to Adonai with their meal offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to Adonai. You are to offer a one male goat for a sin offering, and a pair of year-old male lambs for a sacrifice of a fellowship offerings. The Kohen is to wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Adonai with the two lambs. They should be holy to Adonai for the Kohen. You are to make a proclamation on the same day that there is to be a holy convocation, and you should do no regular work. This is a statute forever in all of your dwellings throughout your generations. Now when you reap the harvest, your, of your land, you are not to reap to the furthest corners of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Rather, you are to leave them for the poor and the outsider. I am Adonai, your God. So in this, we see uh, quite a few different little things. We see that, you know, obviously there's a lot of sacrifices, but there's very specific counting. You are to count. And it's it's uh, so called the counting of the Omer because they would bring an Omer, an Omer was a measurement. Uh, they bring a certain amount of the first fruit offering. That first fruit offering happened to be three days after Passover. So let's think about that. Three days after Passover, the 14th of Nisan, be the 17th of Nisan, and then they were to count for 49 days or seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths. And the day after the seventh Sabbath would be Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks. weeks. It means weeks. So it's the Feast of Weeks. So Shavuot. All right, let's go to number two. So the first Shavuot. So when was the first time that this is talked about? Well, actually, this is an interesting one. In Exodus uh, 19, we know in Exodus 12 through 14, we see the first Passover. We see the time when they're rescued from Egypt. So when we get to 50 days after that time, where are we? Well, we need to see that Passover is not complete until Shavuot. See, from the passage we read in Leviticus 23, it was this constant counting of day after day until you would get to Shavuot. So you'd begin with Passover, you'd have the Feast of First Fruits just three days later, and then you are counting. So there's this constant expectation for the upcoming feast, a constant looking forward to, to this time that is 50 days later. Well, 50 days later, if we look back to the first Shavuot, what do we see? Well, there's a, this is an interesting uh, passage. If we go over to Exodus chapter 19, Exodus 19, and I'm just going to look at it, one or two verses here. 
And just to show uh, the counting, and, and I actually went, and my wife was a little frustrated with me the other night, but I went back and I counted it, because I just wanted to make sure. It's one of those things, you know, I'm a, I'm a mathematician at heart, and uh, I, love, I love my engineering, and I just had to know exactly. Uh, so <laughs> it's just one of those things about me. I like evidence, and I love um, studying out even the little, little nitty-gritty gritty details. So what we see is the first verse in chapter 19. It says, In the third month, after B'nai Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, that same day they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. Well, Nisan, the month of the Passover, God said, Nisan's going to be your first month. And the 14th of Nisan was Passover. Okay, so the 14th of Nisan's Passover, when did they leave Egypt? Well, the day after Passover, right? Because Pharaoh was so mad, he'd lost his son and he kicked him out, so he said go. So they left on the 15th of Nisan and they started walking towards the, the sea. Okay, and a three day journey just happens to get you to the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and between the Sinai and Arabia. So that's most likely where the crossing happened. And so then that's when Pharaoh comes through, and then they passed through the waters uh, and were cleansed through the waters in that way. But on the third month here in chapter 19, so this is the third month in the new calendar. So you've got Nisan and then. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> And then you have, the next one is ER, yeah, yeah. and then you'll have the third month, which is Sivan, Sivan, okay. So the first of Sivan, so when they came to the third month, the first of Sivan uh, would be, just happens to be about three and a half days before the Lord shows up on Mount Sinai. It also happens to be exactly 50 days, if you count, and you can go and count. You know, there's a, there's a calendar back there. If you don't believe me, I did it. I had to do it last night. But 50 days after they had left Egypt, they show up to Mount Sinai and the Lord shows up to them. And so what we see is that Passover was like an engagement. The Lord was coming to the children of Israel and betrothing them to himself, saying, you're mine, I'm yours. And then what we see is that Shavuot, when they show up at Mount Sinai, and the giving of the covenant is the consummation of that marriage. The marriage between the Lord and his people. And the Lord said in Exodus uh, 19 verse 5, it says, Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people. For all the earth is mine, so as for you, you will be to me, a kingdom of Kohanim and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to B'nai Israel. So even in the first century, when Yeshua was walking the earth, it was already connected. Shavuot was already connected to a sense of, of covenant, uh, a, a, the idea of covenant and covenant renewal, renewing your covenant with the Lord. And uh, we see that uh, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai is, is probably one of the most important uh, points, especially for the nation of Israel. Uh, it is the time when the Ten Words were spoken. The ten, we know them as the Ten Commandments. And uh, let's go to the next slide. And so when they show up, uh, the Lord tells them, so the, the first of Sivan, they, the Lord tells them, okay, sanctify yourselves Set yourselves apart, wash your clothes, keep yourselves holy and pure for the next three days because on the third day I'm going to show up to you. And so they, they, they do, they, they keep themselves cleansed and there's a big fence around the mountain because they were told do not touch the mountain, anyone who touches the mountain will die. And so they're waiting for the Lord, there's this expectation of looking forward uh, towards the Lord showing up. So then the Lord comes. And he comes with a rumblings and shoutings and noise, and it shook the whole mountain. And I want to read this, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 22. It says this, 
And all the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. And when all the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. So they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us or we will die. So, God's, so Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. For God has come to test you so that his fear may be in you so that you do not sin. The people stood afar off while Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then Adonai said to Moses, say this to Bnei Israel. You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods of silver alongside me and do not make gods of gold for yourselves. You are to make an altar of earth for me. And there you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, your fellowship offerings, your sheep and your cattle in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned. I will come to you and bless you. When you make an altar for me of stones, do not build it from cut stone. And he goes on with a little bit more detail. But in this we see that the Lord shows up on the mountain with thunderings, with lightnings, with the sound of the shofar. We heard the sound of the shofar earlier. That ringing, but if you can imagine the Lord, the angelic host, blowing a shofar that would entirely shake the mountain. And so everybody stood and trembled, and trembled at the presence of the Lord. But they stood afar off, and Moses drew near to the Lord. And then the Lord says, you have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You know, the, ten, the giving of the ten words is uh, the giving of a marriage contract. It's called a ketubah. It's like the words of a ketubah. The ketubah is the covenant between a man and a wife. It's that covenantal uh, contract. And in the same way, the, the Ten Commandments is like that between God and His people. He's the king, so it's not as though we are equal to him. He is Lord God Almighty. And so in this case, it's more like the covenant that a king would make with the servants, with his people. And he's coming and saying, look, this is what I will do, and this is what you will do. And when we are both on the same page, we are in relationship. Everything that is yours is mine, and everything that is mine is yours. And this is part, and this is this beginning of this uh, contract. In a similar way, the cloud that covered the mountain is very much like the, the, uh, the chuppah that would cover the, the bride and the groom. And there's so many different elements of this, this meeting with the Lord at Sinai that refer to marriage. That when the prophets talk about Israel going after idols, they talk to Israel as an adulterous wife going after other gods. So this is where the Lord equates idolatry as spiritual adultery because he is and was in covenant with his people. And he saw it as a breach of covenant. It is an unfaithfulness to the covenant that was made. But we see this, this in this great demonstration of God just to the people that he is coming into covenant with them. He is giving the stipulations of the relationship. Now we have to understand, I want to read this little quote from Don Levinson, and this shows the true heart of that covenant. Sometimes uh, in our Western mindset, we see laws as only constraints. They're only things that are trying to get in the way of our fun. And that's not the way of covenantal language. That is not covenantal language. You see, to realize her love in the form of observance to her master's stipulations is Israel's part of the covenant. The mitzvot, they are the words of the language of love. In other words, keeping of the commandments is a demonstration of our love. It is the fit medium in which to respond to the passionate advances of the divine suzerain or divine king. It is not a question of law or love, but law conceived in love and love expressed in law. The two are a unity. To speak of one apart from the other is to produce a parity of the religion of Israel. Is the love of God, it is the love of God which moves Israel to embrace his law at Sinai. 
Even Yeshua repeats this when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. For us, keeping the commandments of, of God is not a matter of gaining his affection, but rather expressing our affection and our thankfulness to him. A way of demonstrating that, our, that how much we love the Lord. So let's go to the next slide. So this kind of takes us on the journey that I, I briefly mentioned. Now, notice the line. So we're not going to go crisscross. We're going to go down and up and around just like they meandered in the wilderness for 50 days. So they start with Adonai judging Egypt. We see that judgment finally coming to a head on the 14th of Nisan. 14th of Nisan's Passover where, where the angel of death passed over uh, all of the houses that were covered by the blood of the pure, spotless lamb. Then on the 21st of Nisan, so three days later, we see the parting of the Red Sea, and that is the first week of the Omer. So the counting of the Omer, uh, it wasn't established yet. We know that because it's not written down till after, until they get to Sinai. But it is that first week after Passover. Then you go across to the right, and you see the first of Er is the second week of Passover. So now we're into the second month. Then the third week, you get to the, the middle of the, the, the next month, the 15th of Iyar is when God provided manna from heaven. They cried out to the Lord, we're, we're hungry. And he provides bread from heaven. You get across to the 23rd of Iyar and you get water from the rock. That rock that followed them is Messiah, says the Apostle Paul, I think. Yes, okay, go check me up on that. If I have to find out which letter it is. The first of Sivan is when they arrive at Sinai. So they all show up at the same mountain. Now if you remember, God had promised to Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt, and I'm, you're going to bring the people back here to worship me. This is the same place, the place of the burning bush. And so here Moses is bringing the people back to this mountain. They arrive and then they prepare themselves for three days. And then we have Shavuot, the Torah is given and God marries Israel. Let's go to the next one. All right. So now let's move ahead in the history of the children of Israel. The, the book of Ruth is actually uh, the same time period as this whole journey. Because we know that the book of Ruth is occurring between the barley and the wheat harvests. And that is this time frame in the Northern Hemisphere. I know it's a little cold down here, we're not quite harvesting, but in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, this would be the time of the first harvest, the first fruits, the first fruits of the harvest. And so the whole book of Ruth is often read, and uh, we will actually do that uh, on Shavuot. So we're going to uh, keep that tradition and read through uh, one of the most wonderful love stories ever written, uh, the book of Ruth. So we'll do that uh, on Sunday. But what we see here are several different things. First of all, we, knew, we know that the priest weighed two loaves of bread with leaven. And I mentioned this when we talked uh, right at the beginning of today. Those two loaves, it's the only time that leavened bread was ever offered, at least according, uh, according to what we read in Scripture. The rest of the time, it was unleavened bread or flat bread, right? So leaven always came to be represented as a symbol of sin, especially pride, which puffs us up. And so the waving of two loaves of bread was a representation of us, but it came to be a representation of Jew and Gentile before God, all of mankind being waved before the Lord. And here we have in the book of Ruth, a Moabitess, a Gentile, who is adopted into the family of God. And through Yeshua, we see that Gentiles have been grafted into Israel. We say, just like Ruth said, your people are my people and your God is my God. And that's the same declaration that we, as Gentiles, say, Your, I am now following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the power of Messiah Yeshua. <coughs> Let's go to the next one. So what we see is Boaz. Boaz is known as a goel. 
He is, uh, the word Goel was the name, or it's translated kinsman redeemer. He is the, the one who is a near relative who would redeem the property of, let's say you had a distant cousin, they got too poor, they had to sell their land. Well, you, if, if the Lord had blessed you, you could go and redeem their land, buy their land back to give it, to keep it within the family. Even though after 50 years, you'd get your land back eventually anyway on the year of Jubilee. But that being said, we see that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer to Ruth through Naomi, through uh, her husband, Elimelech. And so the word Goel, if you actually look up Goel uh, in, uh, in the dictionary, in the Jewish dictionary, Goel came to be spiritualized as God redeeming his people Israel. It became synonymous with God's redemption of his people. This concept of Goel, a kinsman redeemer. Well, the Lord himself redeemed the children of Israel from slavery. We saw that in Egypt. Out of Egypt, he's the one who redeemed them from slavery. It says the Lord uh, brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With great signs of uh, great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. So the Lord is that kinsman redeemer. And he is our kinsman redeemer as well. So let's go on. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a bit. But let's talk about the fulfillment of Shavuot. Yeshua said, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. That means to be the completion, to be the ultimate fulfillment of that law. Well, let's look at Shavuot. Shavuot is uh, obviously another name for Shavuot. We know it as Pentecost. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. <coughs> I'm reading from the uh, Tree of Life version. I like it. It's, it's easy for me to read. It says, When the day of Shavuot had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues of fire spread out and appeared to each of them and settled on each of them. And they were filled, all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and began to speak with other tongues as the Ruach enabled them to speak out. And I'll just pause there. We'll, we'll probably go on just a little bit. But what we see is this is the day of Shavuot. Now, ten days earlier... Ten days earlier, Yeshua ascended to heaven. And he said, wait in Jerusalem until the promised one that I will send, the Comforter, comes. So I'm pretty sure that they had a good idea of when the Comforter was coming. I mean, they're counting the Omer. There's already this expectation. There's already this longing towards this, this feast that's coming. And when it says they were all in one house, there's 120 of them in this house. Now, Here's the interesting thing about archaeology. One of the things we know is that there is not a single house in Jerusalem that could house 120 people. So they're not in the upper room. I know that might shock some people, but the upper room was just that. It was a small upper room, big enough for 12, plus maybe a couple of servants to help serve the food, but not big enough for 120. And they were seated, so that, yeah, that takes up even more room. So where is the house? that is big enough to house 120 people. Plus to have an audience of 3,000. And then to have an audience of 3,000 people, which you'll see in just the next couple of verses. Well, it's interesting because the, the title, The House, was synonymous with the temple. It was called The House. Now, it's still called The House, even to this day. Uh, how do you pronounce it in Hebrew? Habayit, Habayit, The House, right? still known as the house and it's because it was the house of the Lord so there's one place where not only could 120 people sit but you could also preach to 3,000 people from all over the world who had come for the feast day as they were commanded they were obeying the commandment to come on Shavuot and then there just so happens to be hundreds of immersion pools, mikvahs, where they could all be immersed in water. Right there, right on the southern slopes. So uh, this photo actually is a photo that was taken of my wife back 
uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, those are the southern excavations on the southern side of the temple, and those they're literally sitting on the place where those immersion pools would be. But notice the similarities between this passage and the passage we read about the mountain. We see a mighty rushing wind. We see tongues of fire, and we hear the voice. But in this time, instead of the Lord simply speaking to the people, He is speaking through the people. As they speak in tongues, filled with the Ruach HaKadosh, and all the nations heard the glories of God through their lips. Let's read the next couple of verses. So starting at verse 5. Now the Jewish people were staying in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound came, the crowd gathered. They were bewildered because they were hearing them speaking in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are these who are speaking, aren't they Galileans? How is it that we each hear our own birth language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and those living in Mesopotamia, Judah and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, towards Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jewish people and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own tongues the mighty deeds of God. They were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one, to one another, What does this mean? Others poking fun. They were saying, Oh, they're just full of sweet new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Fellow Judeans and all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. These men are not drunk as you suppose. For it's only the third hour of the day. That's nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He goes into an incredible uh, sermon there. That's very, uh, you know, it took filling with the Holy Spirit to make Peter say the right thing. Uh, he was one who always used to stick his foot in his mouth. But in this case, filled with the Holy Spirit, he preached an incredible three-point sermon without, without rehearsing it. And he was just em emboldened to speak there in the temple, right there in the open, in the midst of the city of Jerusalem. But here you have people from every nation. Now, if you remember, when Paul writes to the, the church in Rome, he'd never been to Rome. But that congregation in Rome started right here. You see, because they went from here and they took the word of God to the extents of the Roman Empire in one day. This was the calling of the children of Israel. The calling of Israel that was given to Abraham was that they would be a light to the world. That they would be a light to the Gentiles. And that is still the calling. It's, but it's only fulfilled through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see is that the Lord takes it on Himself to fill the 120 there with the Holy Spirit and then to share that to 3,000 that day, 5,000 the next day, and it just grows from there. There and it pours out to the rest of the Roman Empire at that time. And not just the Roman Empire, we see that it even mentions even further, which is the Medes, the Persians, and beyond. Yeah. Can you hold it? You might forget. Oh, go ahead. My wife has a comment. Go ahead. I was just thinking how you're saying that we're supposed to be a light to all the nations. And those nations that are trying to get rid of the Judaic Christian foundation are going right back into paganism. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because you choose one, you can only follow one master. Let's go on to the next one. So here's another timeline. On the next one. There we go. So this is real similar to the, the previous timeline, and I just wanted to kind of take you through this second Shavuot. 
We see that Adonai judges sin and Satan at the cross on the 14th of Nisan, just as Adonai had judged Egypt. Egypt always became synonymous with sin. Coming out of Egypt was synonymous with coming out of sin. And we see that sin and Satan are both judged at the cross. And so that is on the 14th of Nisan when, the, when our Passover land, just as John, John said of Yeshua, he said, this is the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then we see three days later that death could not hold him. And just as the Lord had prophesied through David, death could not hold him, nor could the grave, and he was raised. He is the first fruits of those who have raised from the dead. He was raised on the feast of first fruits. And so the first week, then we go over to the first week of Iyar, which is the second week, third week, on the 15th of Iyar. Now, it wasn't exactly the 15th, but we see, we know, just as the Lord provided bread for heaven to the children of Israel, we know that Yeshua says of himself that he is the bread of life. And that not well, Paul says later that he was the bread from heaven. He's the bread from heaven. Then we go across over, we also know that Yeshua was the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 says, The Messiah is the rock that followed them in the wilderness. Now, I know that's a, an interesting concept, and it, it might be just a figure of speech, but it also, there's a very real reality, that He is our bread of life, and He is the water that sustains us. Then we see the preparation. Yeshua says to the, the disciples, Stay in Jerusalem and wait. Prepare yourselves for what's about to happen. And so we see them going into Jerusalem and waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then we see the, the Ruach given where God marries all who believe. You know, it says of the Spirit of, of God that the Spirit is the seal of those who have been uh, redeemed. He is the seal. He is the, the evidence, if you will, that we're engaged. He's like the marriage ring. You know, the Spirit of God is like the evidence that I'm engaged. Well, in my case, or in, and in ladies' case, is that big ring on the, on the finger saying, I'm taken, I'm claimed, I'm, I, somebody has a claim on me, and I have a claim on them. And that's, what, that's that evidence. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit is called the seal upon us. He, you know, we, we know that the Lord will be faithful to raise us from the dead. Because just in the same way that the Lord raised Yeshua, we have that confidence because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And what the Spirit did, the Spirit raised Yeshua from the dead, so also will the Spirit raise us from the dead. And just like Passover, the first Passover was not complete without the coming to the Mount Sinai, so also... Our Passover with Yeshua dying, that is not complete without the giving of the Holy Spirit. Yeshua himself says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send to you the Comforter who will bring to your remembrance every word that I have spoken to you. Let's go to the next one. And just like Ruth, like the ancient Israelites, we know that it was God himself who achieved the redemption from Egypt and from slavery. And the same is true. It is God himself, the Son of God, who died on the cross because no other man was found worthy. The Lord looked and could find none. We have all sinned. We're all in that same boat. There is none of us that is righteous. There is none of us that is good. Not in God's perspective. I answered a recent questionnaire and uh, they, they had lots of questions about where I stood on different things. But one was... Do you believe that people are basically good? The truth I honestly have to say is that Scripture says that people are basically evil. Jesus himself said it this way. He said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Lord, your Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? There is only one good, and that is God. When we say that we are good, we're just comparing ourselves among ourselves. And that is a bad comparison. We need to compare ourselves 
to the perfection shown in Adonai. But it is God himself, through Yeshua, who takes, has taken away the sin of the world. But our redemption is not complete. Shavuot is also known for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. And in Ephesians 1.3, Paul says, Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. We have been redeemed. We are being redeemed. And we will be redeemed. This is a three-part process. If we are born again, our spirits are made alive in Messiah. We have been justified. The word is justified. Just as if I never sinned. And yet we all know that we have to look in the mirror, don't we? And when we look in the mirror, we don't always see the perfection of God's glory looking back at us. We see the times that we stumble. We see the times that we sin. And so we know that there is this process that we go through where we are becoming more like Jesus. There is this ongoing process of becoming more like Him. That's called sanctification. Sanctification is a fancy way of saying being made holy. Sanctified just means holy. We are being made holy, set apart for the Lord's particular use. And so therefore that is that being saved. And yet there's one day that our bodies will also finally catch up. And we will have been fully glorified. And that's the glorification when we take on an immortal body. When we see God face to face. And so that is our redemption. So just as Boaz redeemed Ruth, so also Yeshua redeemed us. And that, when will the final redemption come? When Yeshua returns. That is when the final redemption comes. And then we shall see him as, or he, because he will see us, we will see him as he is. And then we will become like him. That is a glorious day. We'll all be 33 again. That's, by the way, that's by my guess of age only because it's approximately how old Jesus was when he died. It's just a random guess. But even so, the point is, is we will all be in fullness of health. Our bodies will have finally caught up with the redemption that we have experienced in our spirits. And we always chuckle with that. But that's a longing. It is something that we don't yet see. That is something that we are longing for. The promise of the Holy Spirit, John, John the baptizer said this, He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Yeshua said to wait for the promise of the Father, and that John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Peter quotes Joel in, the, in, in Acts chapter 2, and he says, This is that which was spoken of in the prophet Joel that he shall pour out his spirit upon all flesh. You see, there were many cases in the Tanakh, in the scriptures, where God would pour his spirit out upon an individual. There are many cases that are recorded where an individual uh, would receive the Holy Spirit and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Many of the prophets had that. Many of the kings would have that at certain times. But not upon all flesh. That is the promise in Joel. And that is what we see through the pour, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 43 says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Going on to Jeremiah 32, I will put my fear in their hearts so they will not depart from me. Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle you with clean water and you shall be clean. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. Listen to all these passages that are in the Tanakh promising this promise as the prophets were looking forward to this day when the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. They're longing, waiting for this day. Let's go to the next one. Just like the book of Ruth, we go all the way to the end, Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. 
And it says this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was worthy to open the scroll or even to look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. A scroll was a scroll of covenant, a scroll of property. It was, it was something that, uh, it was like a deed, a deed of sale. All these sorts of deeds or covenants were written down and sealed in a scroll. We see that written in the book of Jeremiah where he purchased the land and rolled it in a scroll and sealed it. And it says no one was worthy to, to redeem this scroll, to redeem mankind. But it says, don't weep, he tells John. The angel tells John, don't weep, because there is one who is worthy. And who is he? Does it reference him as the, the son of God in this case? No. It is one who is near us. It is our kinsman redeemer. It is one who is also a man. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. Here are these references. He is of you. We, as mankind, we needed someone. We needed a, it is our, it is our, uh, we owe it to God. God created us in his image. We were created to worship. We owe God all worship and all honor, but we broke that. But it is not right for God to simply pay the debt and to simply let us go free. That is not right. If, if somebody, let's say somebody um, uh, commits a, a heinous crime, and they go before the judge, and, the, and the, you know, they've, they've, they've raped, they've murdered, they've done something horrific, and the judge looks there, and you have the whole family of the person who's, who's, who's been killed, and the judge turns to the, to the murderer and says, well, you're guilty, but I forgive you. That's not right. And none of us in this room would say that that's right. The whole family would just revolt at that. They would say, that is injustice. They, where is our justice? It is wrong for this man to go free when our family member has died. And in the same way, it is wrong for God to simply forgive mankind's sin without expecting the payment of sin to be paid. But it is wrong for God to simply pay that payment. Because it's us who have broken the covenant. So it needed to be a human, a man, or a woman to pay that penalty. And yet none of us were found worthy. We were all found full of sin. And therefore we had to pay for our own sins. Our own death is payment for our own sins. Yet that doesn't fix God's problem because then we're dead. And God wants us to be alive. Alive in Him and eternally with Him. So the perfect one, God, became a human and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And therefore a man paid the penalty. A perfect, perfect one. Just like Boaz, Yeshua is our Redeemer. He is our kinsman. He is our flesh. He is the one who is close to us, near to us. He is the one who therefore has the right of redemption. It was only a near relative that had the right to redeem the property. And therefore, only a near relative of us could pay for our sin. Only he is worthy to open the scroll and redeem us. You know, many people ask, what is the purpose? Why did God send the Holy Spirit? What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Well, the scriptures say that through the Holy Spirit, they are, all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest in Jeremiah. The Holy Spirit is given so that we might fear God. So that we might remain with God. So that we might follow God's word with our whole heart. Because the Lord says in Ezekiel 36 that He will cause us to walk in His statutes and then we will know His judgments and keep them to do them. It is also to empower us to be a witness to the nation. 
The nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. He is the seal of our salvation. As it says in Ephesians 1.13, Having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit and with promise. He gives us the boldness to speak. Just as it says in Acts chapter 4 verse 31, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke to the Sanhedrin, spoke to those who could lay claim on his life, who could have him executed. And he says, You decide whether it is right for us to follow the rules of man or the directions from God. You decide, but as for us, we cannot but speak of what we have seen, and we cannot but testify for what we are witnesses to, that Yeshua was raised to life by the power of Adonai. The other thing that the Holy Spirit does is He brings the fruit of God in our hearts. The fruit of the Spirit. We must remember that is the outworking of the Spirit of God in our lives. It is very easy to look at somebody's life and recognize when somebody has walked with God for a long time. Because they smell like God. They walk like God. They talk like Him. They have been walking with the Spirit of God. And they, you can see the fruit of the Spirit of joy in the midst of heartache. Of peace. Of love. Patience. Long-suffering self-control, gentleness, faithfulness, and goodness. All of these things are grown in us when we spend time in the presence of the Spirit of God. Finally, He sanctifies us. He's the one who makes us holy. He saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 verse 5. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, He cleanses us. He makes us holy. Some people forget that. What's the first, this is a, somewhat of a joke, but what's the first name of the Holy Spirit? He's the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is in our lives, He makes us holy. Set apart for the Lord. Alright, let's. Uh, we're going to close with this passage. Here, go to the next one. What, fellow brethren, what shall we do? This is the response after Acts chapter 2, that all the crowd, the 3,000 that are surrounding Peter, they were cut to their heart. And Peter pulled no bones. He pointed straight and says, Yeshua, whom you had killed. And they said, brethren, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. Peter answers, Teshuva, repent, return to Adonai. Emunah, have faith, trust, believe that Adonai raised Yeshua from the dead. And Tehillah, be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua for the removal of your sins. And then Kablu Ruach HaKodesh, which is receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. So we are to repent. To return to Adonai. We are to believe on Adonai. That Adonai raised Messiah Yeshua from the dead. For the removal of our sins we should be immersed in water. And then receive the Holy Spirit. And I wrote down two other reasons. Because the next chapter talks about the healing of the lame guy. And this time there were two other reasons. Two other motivations that Peter says. Here's some reasons why you should all believe. He says in Acts chapter 3 verse 20, he says, So that, believe on the Lord Yeshua, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of Adonai. And this times of refreshing was a reference to the millennial reign. It's a reference to the return of Yeshua. He's very clear in here. So that he might send Yeshua, the Messiah, the promised one for us. This is another reason why we go out and share the good news to people. So that Yeshua will come back sooner. There's a number. God's waiting. He's trying to spread the nets for as many people. And we get to be a part of that. 
We get to be a part of that as we drop seeds in the, in the people at work. We, we ask them questions that are difficult. We get hated for it. Sure, I get that. But at the same time, we choose to respond in love. We, we choose to respond in love. No matter what gets thrown our way, that must be our response. And uh, we get to be a part of that harvest so that, so that times of refreshing may come. So that he might send Yeshua, the appointed, the one who was appointed to be the Messiah. So this is, this is the exciting part. So Father God, we just thank you that we get to participate in the harvest with you. And Lord, we are asking for a fresh in filling of your Holy Spirit. The boldness that, that Peter prays for in Acts chapter 4. Lord, where you filled them afresh with boldness so that they could go out and speak. Lord, we are asking for that same boldness. That you would fill us with boldness. Lord, fill us afresh with your love. Lord, fill us afresh with just uh, more of you. More love in our hearts for, the, for our neighbors. More love in our hearts for our co-workers. Lord, that you would just overwhelm us with your love for those around us. So that we therefore share the good news. Lord, because it is the greatest demonstration of love to share the good news with the people around us. And so we are asking, Lord, I am asking for myself, Lord, for a greater boldness, a greater infilling of your love, Lord, for the people around me. Uh, Lord, just, just open our hearts that we might speak your word with boldness. We thank you for that in Yeshua's name. Amen.